Hello, welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is the Great Big History Podcast. In this episode, we're going to talk about art in the Renaissance. It's going to be a brief overview. But mostly we're talking about changes. And so if we're going to talk about changes, we have to talk about how art was in the Middle Ages, before the Renaissance, before the changes. And what we have is art in the Middle Ages and medieval art was religious, primarily religious, but also symbolic and representational. So we're mostly talking about religious themes. A lot of Jesus, a lot of Mary and Jesus, a lot of Holy Family, a lot of Jesus and John as babies running around. It's, it's kind of like Art 101. Okay, let's do the Holy Family. So if you ever go to the Louvre, if you ever go to some of the Italian Renaissance museums, you're going to be bored after seeing so many holy families. So religion is the major theme. The second thing is it's symbolic and representational, which means things did not look like reality. Things stood in for other things. So let's draw three stick figures. Okay, draw three stick figures. Draw one that's tall and two that are smaller. So we got three stick figures, one that's taller and two that are smaller. What did you just draw? You are in the post-Renaissance. So you may have looked at that and said, I drew a family. I drew a dad and two kids. I drew a mom and two kids. I drew an adult. I drew someone who was tall and two people who were short. But in the Middle Ages, that's not what you drew. On the tall one, now put a crown. Put a little hat. What you drew was a king and his lords, king and the peasants. The size of the person represented their importance. It's symbolic. So, if you're a lord, you would draw yourself. If it's your, your painting, you would draw yourself taller. So, if you want to do this, draw three more stick figures, right? Same thing. One large, two smaller. Now put the crown on one of the smaller guys. Here's the question. So you're the Lord. You're the big guy. You have that hanging up on your wall. Do you want to invite the king over for dinner? No. Why? Because the king is going to take a look at that. And he's going to say, uh, you are taller than me in that. You're bigger than I am. And you're going to say, ah, 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 ah. And he's going to say, yeah, I don't think that's right. So that's what you think, eh? Because it's symbolism. It's representational. The size counted for importance. And so if you show... The king smaller than you, you were saying you are better than the king. And if the king sees that, he's going to be pissed because he understands that language immediately. You don't get to get away with, well, I'm six foot three and you're five foot eight. It doesn't matter. It's symbolic. So we'll see war scenes in medieval art where the king is taller than the walls. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you he won the war. Tells you he captured a city because he is taller than the walls are. Now, could a man physically be taller than a city wall? No, of course not. But it stands in for power. 
Renaissance art is about realism. And to have realism, you need two aspects, proportion and perspective. So let's talk about perspective. Perspective is the ability to make a three-dimensional image in a two-dimensional space. The painting I have up here is the very famous School of Athens. And take a look at how far back these rooms go. And yet it's on a flat wall. And so what the painter is able to do is create a three-dimensional space. It looks like you can go into that. It looks like you could walk to the back of that. What this creates is depth and volume. Go back to our medieval art. Take our two paintings, one of St. Michael, one of the Holy Family, none of them have depth. You don't really get how how wide, how how far back, how much weight these guy these characters have. They're humans, but they're flat. Whereas go to the School of Athens, and not only do the people have weight and mass, but the rooms have weight and mass. you know how far back it goes. Now, all of this is a mathematical illusion. You go, well, why don't the medieval people have this? And it's, it's partly because they don't have the math. There's a vanishing point, and you can kind of see it right above the head of Plato and Aristotle, right up the two guys in the center who are walking, right above their head is where all the lines go to. You can draw lines from any point, from people's heads to the, the arch in the ceilings, to the, the hallways themselves, and you will end up in that point. And what that does is trick your eye into um, seeing three dimensions. And the reason why is you have what's called stereoscopic sight. Stereo, S-T-E-R-E-O, scopic, S-C-O-P-I-C. What does that mean? It means you have two eyes, slightly apart. So what does that mean? It means you see two different images. You see the world two different ways. Each eye is seeing a different thing. So you go, wait, 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 professor. No, 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 no. I don't see two things. I see one thing. Well, yeah. Why? Because your brain overlays the two. But your brain is seeing two separate images. And what it does is it overlays the two. And if you take your palms, take your palms out, right? So they're flat and facing you. So you got your fingers facing you, the, the bottoms of your fingers facing you, all right? Thumbs up, right? And now put the right one over the left one and move them both to the center. All of a sudden, you have depth. You have two separate images that are creating depth, three dimensions. Now, this is simplistic. I give you the science and the math are much more complicated, but this is essentially what's happening. And so by using perspective, by using this math, by using what's called a vanishing point, we are creating three dimensions in a flat space, a two dimensional space. What this does is make paintings look like sight. For the first time, the paintings are really looking like how you would see them. They look like reality. Which brings us to proportion. Great. So we have reality. We can make something have depth. We can make something have three dimensions. It looks like how I see it. But that doesn't matter if all the sizes are wrong. That's not reality then. Remember our 10, our 40 foot tall king over a wall? There's no proportion there. How big are those walls? You don't know. And the artist doesn't care. He's telling you this king is powerful. Well, proportion rejects that representation. Proportion wants to make things the correct size in their environment. That's what it wants to do, that everything is the correct size. 
in their environment. Because if they're not, it looks wrong. Again, we go back to our wall and our 40-foot tall king. If he's taller than the wall, you go, wait, that doesn't, there are no 40-foot tall people. How big is all this? Is it a, is it a, a, a play set? What am I looking at? So what you need is biological accuracy. What you need is to get things to certain sizes. Again, we're back to math. See, here's the thing. I've got a 10 foot by 15 foot canvas. You know, that's not reality. I can't physically put a real person in there. Well, maybe I can at 10 feet. But if I want to paint a 30 foot tall, a 30 foot wide room, I can't do it. So now all of a sudden everything has to shrink to fit in. But everything has to shrink together so that they're proportional to all other things. To do that, you have to have biological accuracy. You have to know sizes, how things work, how things connect. You have to have the math. You have to have the observation to make things now look, to make that pen sit in your hand and look like it's a regular old pen sitting in a regular old hand, you have to have, not only does the pen in the hand have to fit, the wrist has to fit, the elbow has to fit, the head has to fit, they all have to be the right size compared to each other. That's what proportion does. It creates uniformity of size within an environment. So on my canvas, it's one third. I want. I have a ten foot long canvas. I have a thirty foot long room. Everything will be shrunk to one third. To make it even remotely correct in proportion to everything else in the scene. So I've got that. The other thing is, I want to make things look like reality. Remember, we're back to realism, and so. What I need to know is how do things work? And that's medical knowledge. For the first time since the Romans, there's an explosion in medical research and knowledge because we need to know how the body works. We need to know muscles and movement. That when you flex your, like a little kid, you, you flex your bicep to show how strong you are. Urgh, flexing my bicep. You have to know how the bicep moves, how it goes up in that curve. Because if you don't do that, it doesn't look right. And all right, you flex your bicep, but you are also flexing your elbow, your wrist, your tricep, and you have to know how all those things work. So here is um, two paintings. One, they're both of St. Michael. One is a Byzantine icon on the left. The other one is Raphael on the right. It's, it's one of my favorite paintings. I've seen it live in, in uh, Florence. Uh, it's gigantic. It's huge. It's awesome. Um, look at them. They both show St. Michael. And yet the one on the left doesn't give you a sense of movement. It's a body. It's got wings. He's holding a sword and a globe. He's got the halo. He's obviously important. But that elbow doesn't look quite right. His right elbow certainly doesn't look right. He's kind of just standing in space. Does he have weight? Mass? And yet, in Raphael's painting, we have the entire story. Raphael has knocked down this demon. He's got a giant spear. We know how fast he was moving. How do we know how fast he was moving? Because of the um, billowing fabric that he has flown through. It is so far behind him, he must have moved fast through it. Is he going to kill the demon? Yeah. Why? Because he has a spear? No. He could have tickled the demon. But look at his right arm. Look at his bicep. 
Look at his forearm. Look at his grip way up at the top. Look at the tricep and the bicep and the bulging forearm on his left hand, his guiding hand. He is going to drive that in the next two, three seconds. He is driving that spear right through the middle of the back of that demon. Well, what about the demon? Is he going to get up? Well, we see from his right, we see from his left arm, he's trying. He's got good purchase. He's got his hand down. He's doing a push-up. He's pushing up. His arm is flexing. His shoulder is flexing. He's got some power there. But his right hand has nothing. His right hand is still gripping his weapon. He's been knocked over so fast that he fell onto his left arm. He's trying to push himself up on his left arm, but his right arm has, is giving him nothing. So at the very least, he's going to push over one way and Michael's going to stab him. Take a look at Michael's legs. Take a look at his billowing hair. But to do all of this, to know how this is working, you have to know how muscles work. You have to know how biology works. You have to know what happens under the skin when you flex, when you move. And so you needed medical knowledge. You needed knowledge of the body, which is huge. Why? Because the body is gross, especially in the Middle Ages. The body does terrible, horrible things. There's the Black Plague in which boils come bursting out of it. There's all kinds of diseases. If you've ever had children, when they throw up, it's not pleasant. Stuff comes out of them you wish wasn't there. If you've ever been sick and got an infection, terrible, horrible things come out of your body. The body is sinful in the Middle Ages. The body wants dirty, disgusting things. Look back at our Dante. Everybody goes to hell. Why? Because they do things that feel good to their body. They have sex. They drink. They lie. They steal. They do all kinds of things. And all the things that they're doing are feel good, but they are bad things. And so the body in the Middle Ages is seen as bad, corrupt, sinful. Remember, you go to heaven, you don't bring your body with you. You go as a spirit. You leave your body behind, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. You leave it behind on earth, and your spirit goes to heaven. You are free of it. And so why would you study that? It's gross. It's terrible. What the Renaissance artists are saying is the body is magnificent. The body is worth study. Look at how it moves. Look at how it acts. Look at how it changes. Look at how it grows. Look at how it looks in this sunlight, in that sunlight. Renaissance art is still going to be religious, but it's also going to hit classical ideas too. Remember, the Renaissance is about a rebirth of classical knowledge. So you're going to get a whole lot of gods, a whole lot of Zeus, a whole lot of the three graces. That allows artists to paint naked women. You're going to get the furies, angry women. You're going to get tons of Greek and Roman mythology come pouring out. A lot of Christian religion, but also a lot of Roman and Greek paganism. Their stories, the dramas from Aeschylus and Sophocles, these big scenes. And so the idea of this is to paint them as realistically as possible. But not even realistically, like gritty realism. They want to paint them ideally. Like, look at Michael in our Raphael painting. He's beautiful. He's gorgeous. He's not, he doesn't have blood on him. He doesn't have dirt on him. You would never know. He could be on a fashion shoot for Vogue. You would never know he was in a battle. Go back to our Leonardo self-portraiture of his body and movement. 
the body is a wonderful vessel. Again, an idealized version. And so what the Renaissance artists are taking is that classical notion that the body is beautiful, that the body is magnificent, that the body is a wonderful machine, and rejecting the idea that the body is gross and sinful. And it's worth study, and it's worth representing, recreating, and portraying in heroic manners that look like they could really happen in a real environment. And to do that, you need a proportion and perspective. All right. That's, that's going to be um, the end of Renaissance art. It's a little, little piece. Uh, thank you for listening, and take care. Thank you.